Hello and welcome to Simulation Television. My name is Sean Gedman and today we're going to go over simulation action, simulation mold flow, a cool FEM overview, but in this video we're going to cover particularly how to model or uh, model this within the Synergy interface, not bringing over your uh, mold assembly from your CAD package as an assembly. So a problem description. This exercise, we're going to look at setting up a cool FEM analysis using the modeling tools within Synergy. Some key learning objectives that we'd like to cover during the presentation will be, of course, an overview of the cool FEM analyses, and out the, some of the analysis options that you'll have in this module, modeling procedure within Synergy, and then just a few tips and tricks to help you along your way while you're uh, carrying out this process. So some modeling entities that you'll um, be working with when setting up cool FEM will be uh, your cooling channels. They can be 1D beams. Your part can be 3D or dual domain. Uh, you're going to have a mold mesh that will be made out of 3D tetrahedrals. And if you want inserts, they would also be 3D tetrahedrals as well. So when you're setting up the analysis, you're going to have three different ways for our um, three different options for your mold temperature. So in your process settings, you'll see this drop down right in the cool FEM page. And the first one's going to be average within cycle. And what this is, is it's, it's basically still a steady state calculation that you would um, see somewhat in the regular BEM solver, the typical cool solver, but we're going to use a finite element method here. Um, and some benefits to that, of course, is you, you don't have to follow those L over D ratios that you have had to in the traditional cool solver. You no longer have to make your beam elements match the two and a half to one length of diameter ratio. Um, this, of course, gives you more flexibility in modeling maybe some more complex uh, cooling scenarios where you need that higher resolution mesh on your, your beam elements. And then another option we'll have is transient within the cycle. And what this is going to do is the steady state is going to give you a singer, single snapshot average over the cycle, a lot of the temperatures. So the transient within cycle, that's going to show you throughout the cycle, you're going to be able to see how the mold heats up as molten plastic enters it. And then of course cools down throughout the cycle. You're going to see a full temperature history there. And your third and final option will be transient from production startup. And what this is going to do is it's going to essentially um, use a transient solver. It's going to heat the mold up, cool it down, and it's going to go over several cycles until the solver sees the mold temperature stabilize. Once we hit that stabilization, it's basically going to do the transient within cycle calculation since that's, that's all that's really necessary at that point. So a general workflow, we're going to go over a short demo with this, but to cover the workflow, essentially you're going to have some model preparation uh, for your CAD model, create your 3D part for your mesh, create your cooling channels. Now you can do this in your CAD package or you can do it within uh, the mold flow software. And then you'll create your mold boundary, create a surface mesh on the mold boundary. You'll check that surface mesh on your mold boundary and then convert that mold boundary mesh into a 3D mold mesh. And at that point, you would be ready to start your analyses. So just to cover some CAD model preparation and export, typically, if you're bringing everything over from CAD, you're going to have two CAD models here. One would be of your part. The second one would be of your IGIS curves, just the center line curve that represents your cooling line and you would use some of these export options here typically when exporting that. And as I said, you, can, you don't have to have both. You can model your cooling line still within the cool solver that it, or within Synergy itself. That would be fine. So on to our demo. Of course, the first thing you're going to do is import your part. Um, very typical procedure. And what I like to do next it's, it's a nice pointer is to put our injection cone before I create my part mesh 
because if you know the center coordinate at the top of your sprue, we can create a node here and place our injection cone and that makes sure that our, our injection cone will be centered on that top of that sprue and when you go to mesh the part it will integrate that into the mesh and you don't have to worry about modifying your mesh or shifting things around afterwards. So we set our mesh up and then the next thing we'll do is of course we want to create our uh, defined local mesh densities. One thing is you'll want to make sure to change your surface selection type to CAD surface not CAD body. And at this point you can select your entities that you want to modify or assign your mesh density to and for this we're going to do 0.8 millimeters on our sprue feed system and gate. The rest of the part of course is going to be uh, meshed here with a global edge length of 1.4 millimeters because I'd like a little more refinement in my feed system. So I'll let that mesh. Our mesh is complete. So what we want to do at this point is we, all these elements are essentially assigned as a 3D part property. So we want to come in here and change the properties of our feed system to a 3D coal runner. And to do that, we just band select our entities, right click, change property type to cold runner 3D. It's telling us that all of our entities have been converted successfully. And then from this point, we're going to, of course, add, I created the cooling lines in our CAD package, so I'm going to import the IGIS center line curves, or the IGIS curves representing the center line of our cooling system. Once you have that in, I just kind of like to shut our layers off so I can focus on what I'm working with. At this point, we're going to delete anything that's left over that we don't really need. We have some runoffs here, some, some extra curves that, that we don't need. This particular system is going to have a, a baffle in it. And once we have these curves in here, I typically assign the properties to them. So you're just going to highlight everything. Right now we're highlighting our channels and we'll right click properties. It's telling us we don't have properties assigned. So we're gonna come in here this time and assign a channel property diameter eight millimeters. And then we're gonna do the same thing for our hoses. Typically, you'd like to run hoses outside of our mold boundary. So have this in mind, um, you know, put some extensions on your cooling lines. And we'll change that to a hose and hose is just going to factor into the pressure calculations throughout the circuit, not the, not the thermal calculations. And then here we're just going to assign our baffle property. We have an up and a down in our baffle. So at this point, we're done with the cooling system other than meshing it. So we'll come up here and mesh. We'll just set this at uh, say four millimeters for this exercise, that should be adequate. And you notice I turned my other layers off because when you do mesh something, it will mesh whatever's visible when you're using the standard mesher. So we wanna make sure our part's definitely not active for this step. So from this part, we'll just assign some cooling inlets here and once you click on your boundary condition, you can see we'll just keep it at the default 25C, keep it at pure water, but you could change this if you wish. And we're gonna put one inlet on each circuit. You need at least, at least one inlet on each circuit. All right, now our cooling system's done, so we're going to turn on everything, all our layers at this point, and we want to start thinking about building our mold boundary. So the first step of that is to go into our geometry menu and use the mold surface wizard. So the mold surface wizard generally has a, a good default for what your mold size is, but basically we want to keep everything contained within this mold block. Um, 
keep it representative of what you would typically have on the shop floor maybe for this part. And uh, the hoses would be the exception that we keep outside of there. See how we're extended out a little bit. Now from this point, we're going to go in and create our, our boundary mesh for the mold surface. So you just come in here, the 3D mold wizard, and we'll do um, set our mesh type up, our external global edge length and internal global edge length. I set the internal to our uh, uh, same size as our part, 1.4 millimeters. The external doesn't have to be as coarse. You could see it around the perimeter of the block here, and you just mesh it. Now at this point, just like any meshing procedure, you want to do a sanity check or a quality check on it. So you can come into the mesh statistics, and I typically turn all the layers off, only show the mold boundary, and then, of course, we'll change what we want to query to triangles, because that's what we're looking at. That's the element type. And then check the box to restrict the visible entities. So we're just looking at what we have here. And of course, no free edges, manifold edges, non-manifold edges, you want to avoid these things. And then from there, it checks. So we're just going to go in and create our, our 3D mesh by going into that same mesh menu and meshing the part. Now you'll notice we have uh, a 3D mold block here and we're pretty much set at this time. So I'll just do a quick cut on this part so you can see these elements or these internal elements, how it was laid out and um, did surround all of our, our components that were in there. So you can see. So that's the end of our demo at this point. Um, we'll go into a couple things, you know, tips and tricks to help you through. We went through the procedure, but we'll cover some tips and tricks that you want to keep in mind when running through this to, to just make your life a lot easier during this procedure and make sure that you get the best uh, setup possible. So some of our, our first tricks, as I mentioned, set your injection cone before meshing. It just, it just helps you center it on the top of your sprue a little easier. It's not necessary, not required. You can always move it around afterwards, but um, you know you have to be careful when modifying a 3D mesh. It, it can get messy if, if uh, you, you modify it a little too much without using the standard tools. Cooling lines, you want them to extend beyond the tool block, typically. So you can see on our left here, it's in, internal to the mold. That's not what we want. Um, the mold block, when we're creating it through the wizard, it's using this to base how the mold block's going to be created. So you know you want this to go be going outside of the mold, or else um, you're not going to have a, a clear exit on the mold. And typically, what we'll do is use hoses to connect um, the cooling circuits or the, the cooling circuits you have drilled within the tool. And this is similar to what you would do in reality anyway. You know, these would be outside the block. They would be factored in the pressure calculations again, but not the temperature because, you know, these aren't internal to the mold, but they are tying our circuits together and influencing the pressures that we would see in reality. Um, another thing you want to be careful of is that when we brought our curves in, you notice we assigned the properties to that, those curves and then meshed them into beam elements. Well, doing it in that procedure made sure that they both shared the same uh, properties, you know, the same diameter. Uh, if you decide to, say, modify your beams after that, maybe you want to experiment, enlarge your cooling line diameter or maybe even shrink them a little bit, Make sure you do that to the curve as well, because the, the mold block's going to factor that in. And in this case, you can see I, uh, I, I made the beam diameter itself smaller in this section, but I didn't adjust the curve dimension, and it based that, that dimension when it built the mold block off of the curve and gave us an oversized, uh, basically, hole in the mold. You know, we don't want that. 
Another tip or trick that we have is that for baffles, you'll notice that I use the basically kind of an A-frame technique here where you have uh, the bottom of the baffle, it, it has a curve up and a curve down and the entrance and exit points are offset a little bit. This, this is great for um, keeping things clear when modeling and you know it will be good in most it, it will be good but really the preferred method would be to uh, still have those two curves but have them overlapping and that just makes it a little easier for um, the, the solver and it makes it uh, a little easier to explain when you're displaying it because you can see below we're kind of uh, coming outside of what the mold block, block created um, And that's all I have for now. And hopefully you've learned something today with our uh, simulation TV episode. Thank you.